Hey friends, welcome back to Truth Shots. You know, I'm really glad you've tuned in today because I feel like I've got a special word for a group of people that I know watch regularly. I want everybody to watch this one because I think it's helpful content for all Christians. But for you that are women, I've got a word for you today. I have been holding on to this word for over a year and literally thought maybe two other times I was going to be sharing it in different congregations and the Lord just went in a different direction. And ultimately, when we were planning uh, the time today to be able to speak to you, I really felt like the Lord said, now's the time I'll have the right people in front of their screens when this message goes live. And so today I wanna to talk to you about what I'm calling the daughter's inheritance. And we're gonna be moving around in a few different passages of scripture, but I'm gonna start in the book of Numbers. That's right. The book of Numbers. Nobody is in the book of Numbers these days, but I'm going to be there today. Chapter number 27. And I think that when we get into this word together, God's going to do something, especially in his daughter's hearts. So I'm grateful that you've tuned in today to this episode of Truth Shots. One of the things that the Lord has spoken to me both through his word and quite frankly through some prophetic words that were given to me over the years one of the things that i know i carry right now in this season is a commission from heaven to help the daughters of god you that are my sisters in christ um, i believe that this is a very unique season in the history of the church and I believe what I see God releasing and even more and more on increasing levels is his desire to use his daughters to bring forth his glory in this generation. Now, we all know that globally, historically, there has been a very clear oppression of women and not just in the sense of the religious oppression. It's just the way that mankind has always worked. I mean, it was the daughter of God, Eve, in the Garden of Eden that the serpent went after. Historically, because of sin, because of males' inability to really know how to honor the Lord with their treatment of females, we've just seen this thing being blown out of proportion for the entire history of humanity. If you ask me who is the most oppressed people group on earth, it's not a racial group. It's women. Women are the most oppressed group. Now, hold on a second, because I don't want any Christian woman to start viewing herself right off the bat as some victim. No, what I'm saying is this. That's the reality that we live in. But the greater reality is the power of Jesus Christ in all of us helps us to come out of the identity of victimhood. And instead of being a victim, we're a victor. We win. But that doesn't mean that there's not a battle. And one of the things that I believe that God is doing as we approach the end of the age is he is leveling the playing field. He is going to fight and push back hard against the oppression of his daughters, because as we all know, we're made in the image of God. And the Bible is very clear about God's heart towards women, knowing that they have been oppressed, knowing that physically speaking, women are called by scripture, the weaker vessel. That means they just can't have a fair fight physically with most males. It doesn't mean that there aren't some exceptions. There clearly are. But for a general broad uh, headline, women are weaker than men. And men have used their strength not to bless women, not to honor women not to elevate, promote, protect, and provide for women. But historically, we have seen, out, especially outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that most cultures oppress and suppress womanhood. Well, Jesus Christ, when he came to do his earthly ministry, the largest contingent of people that eagerly followed him were women. It was at the cross where all the men fled and abandoned Jesus, his 12, but the women pressed in. Only John, the beloved, was among the disciples that went to the cross with Jesus to behold him there. But it was all the women that were there. It was the women that met him first as he resurrected from the grave. It was the women who came alongside of him and served and ministered um, in, in the background to all the men. Now, whereas I do believe in male headship in the family and in the church, I think that's clear in scripture. I don't think that we understand what that's supposed to look like. I do believe that God has anointed, gifted, and called women to lead in the kingdom. 
Why would he give a leadership gift and ability to a woman and then tell her she can't use it? So the question is, what's happening now at the end of the age? And I'm going to take you to an old passage of scripture way back in the Old Testament in the days of Moses. And then we'll move into Joshua. And there's five women who are coming on behalf of their their desire to receive all that the Lord has appointed for them. Now, let me read you these handful of verses from Numbers chapter 27, and I want you to stick with me. And daughters of God, my sisters in Christ, I want you to ask yourself, can you receive what God has for you? Can you receive it as a daughter, as a woman, as a female, and not have to be like a man to receive it? And do you believe that God's very best, both what he gives to you and what he has withheld from you, do you believe that um, you can honor him in that? Well, let's walk through those questions and more together. So in the book of Numbers, I'm going to read seven verses from Numbers 27. And uh, there's some strange names in here, so bear with me a little bit. But don't lose track of the big picture as we get further into this. The Bible says in Numbers 27, 1, that then drew near the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hafer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, from the clans of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. The names of his daughters were Mela, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the chiefs and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but he died for his own sin and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan? Because he had no son. Now listen to what they say. Give to us a possession among our father's brothers. Moses brought their case to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, the daughters of Zelophehad are right. You shall give them possession of an inheritance among their father's brothers and transfer the inheritance of their father to them. Now, on a surface reading, you may be wondering, Jeff, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with the kingdom? What does this have to do with what God is doing and saying right now? Well, I think it has more than meets the eye. So you've got these five sisters. Their names are a little strange, but they their dad died in the wilderness years in Egypt. Now Israel's getting ready to move into the promised land. But the laws of that time were that when a father died, his inheritance passed down to his sons. But this man, Zelophehad, had no sons. And so all of that land inheritance, all of that would have been uh, their father's was now going to be dispersed and the daughters would get nothing. And so they recognize that as they're moving into a promised territory, a place of blessing, a place of land that flows with milk and honey, a place that God had appointed to them. Now their father is dead and there's nobody that's fighting for their inheritance. They tend or they stand um, potential to lose everything and have nothing simply because they are women. With all of the laws and all of the culture and all of the systems set up that the inheritance would be passed down to the males, there were no males. And so they they did something risky. <clears throat> they wanted to honor their father's name. They wanted that everything that he had accumulated that was rightfully his by the laws of inheritance would go to them. But they knew that that's not the way the system worked. And so they did something risky. And I'll walk you through some of the risk in it. And this is what I'm trying to say to the daughters of God right now. The whole thing is about the inheritance of the father. And when we're making application to those of us that are in the body of Christ now, not under Old Testament law, not having to deal with the Mosaic laws of inheritance, but it has a spiritual application. You want to honor your father, right, my sisters? You, you want your father, <clears throat> your heavenly father, to receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise from your life. But in order to do that, you need to possess everything that he's given to you. And quite honestly, some of the systems that have been in place, some of the structures, some of the way church things happen, I don't think that they've always made those things that the Father has for you readily available. And that's the message that's burning on my heart. But in order for it to come to pass in your life, you're going to have to take some cues from these five sisters, the five daughters of Zelophehad, 
And you're going to have to get bold before the Lord so that he can give you what he's designed for you. So here's the one of the first things they did. They recognized they're about to move into the promised land and nothing's coming to their family. Nothing's coming to their father's house. Nothing because he didn't have sons. He had daughters. And they're recognizing we don't want our father's name to be diminished in the future of Israel. We want that inheritance to maintain itself within my father's bloodline. And so what do they have to do? They have to come and ask for something that won't be handed to them. It won't be handed to them if they don't ask. It will probably just pass through and it'll end up going to some other males in the distant family, some cousins, some uncles, some nephews. It'll go somewhere else other than the, to them. And so they get bold. Now, notice what they have to do. The verse, Numbers 27, 2 says this, that they had to come and stand before Moses. I mean, that's not a small thing. It's Moses, the leader of the people, the revered man of God. They had to stand before Moses, who was their kind of apostolic leader, the guy who was in charge of everything. Not only Moses, they had to stand before Eleazar. He's the religious leader. He's the high priest or the priest. And then they had to stand before all the governing leaders. It says in verse two, it was not only Moses and Eleazar, the priest, but all the chiefs of the congregation. They're all men. And then on top of that, they had to go to the, uh, the entrance of the tent of meeting so they had to present themselves publicly in front of all of the people of Israel and they had to ask what God had put, what they had to ask for what God had put on their heart. They basically come before the Lord and they say, our father has died. Moses, my daddy died. Eliezer, our daddy died. All the elders, our dad died and we have no brothers. And we've come to say that the inheritance of the father shouldn't be given to others. We're the daughters and we want it. Now, some might pe people might say that that's bold or that's presumptuous. I don't think so at all. I think it's right. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you in the word of God that they actually asked for what God wanted to do. Except that here's the deal. If they didn't ask for it, God may not have given it. This is where I'm at. And if I can speak directly to my sisters in Christ, there are some things in the kingdom that aren't presently yours. There's some things that are on the heart of God to give his daughters that maybe aren't being given because the daughters of God aren't asking. Maybe you've bought into the oppression. Maybe you've brought into the suppression. Maybe you've brought into the dismissal that for some reason in a lot of places in the kingdom, women are treated like secondhand citizens. And that's wrong. Now, I do believe that there are certain things in the kingdom that are reserved for men, but not as many as we think. And so these daughters come and said, we want what uh, will honor our father. And then Moses takes their case before the Lord. Moses goes into the tent of, of meeting, the tabernacle. He calls on the Lord and the Lord says to Moses, and this is where you know they were praying for the right thing. They were asking for the right thing. Moses says, those daughters of Zelophehad are right. Give them a possession of the inheritance among their brethren, that's the other males in the family, transfer the inheritance of their father to them. Now, I love that. So it took a lot of courage for these women to go before Moses and say, we believe this is what the Lord wants for us. Then they had to do it with Eleazar. Then they had to do it with all the elders. Then they had to do it with all of the people, all the men in the congregation of Israel. You don't know how intimidating that would have been in that culture for these women to step up and say, we want the father to be glorified and honored in our life as we move into the promised land. And daughters of God now that I'm talking to right now, I'm, I'm saying, I think the Lord's asking some of you to press in. It doesn't matter if this person got in the way or this system got in the way or, or the, the way things are structured in a culture or in a church. you got to go before the Lord and say, God, give me the inheritance among your sons. Give me my portion of the inheritance among my brothers. Give me, God, what belongs to me. Now, many years would pass. Moses would die. And finally, Israel moves into the promised land. But there's a new leader and his name is Joshua. And many years have gone by. Maybe not 10, but enough time has gone by to where what they were promised still hasn't come into their hands. So there's that aspect of having to wait. And sometimes when we have to wait on the Lord, we we, we diminish in our hunger. Well, I, I was really hungry when I was asking for it. And I really believed it when it was promised to me. But some time has passed and it hasn't manifested yet. And so I don't know. Maybe God changed his mind. Well, listen, these ladies didn't do that because now in Joshua chapter 17, 
Now they're entering into the land and the land's being divided up. And those women are now a little older. They've waited a little while, but watch what happens. It's a little bit of a recap, but it's now in present time. They're in the land and it says in Joshua 17, 3, Zelophehad, the son of Hefford, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And the names of the daughters are Mela, Noha, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. They approached Eleazar the priest. So they're going back to Eleazar, who would have remembered the earlier meeting. But now they're coming before Joshua, the son of Nun. He's the guy that has to make it happen. He's the yes or the no guy. He's going to give the answer. And the leaders come back before, excuse me, the women come back before the new leader. And they say, Yahweh, the Lord, commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. They just said, hey, we haven't lost it. We haven't. We haven't forgotten about it. We're now ready to receive what God said belongs to us. And so the Bible says that in verse number four of Joshua 17, so according to the mouth of the Lord, Joshua gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. So in other words, all the other uh, brothers like Halophazad, Zelophehad's brothers, their sons got that inheritance and these daughters got their father's inheritance within that family clan. They got it. Everything that God wanted them to have was now theirs. It's an amazing, by the way, a law ended up getting established in Israel because of these women's courage. All women later on in the nation of Israel had inheritance rights underneath their father. Their courage changed the whole system, but somebody had to go for it. Somebody had to be bold. Somebody had to get convinced that the father, their father, his inheritance was worthy of them contending for, asking for, and waiting upon. Now, again, you might be wondering, Jeff, this is Old Testament stuff. It doesn't really have anything to do with us. Well, not so fast. Let me give you a statement in the New Testament in Acts chapter number two. And it's the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy from Joel chapter two. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the day of Pentecost, okay? And let me read to you from Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to help you see a little bit more clearly the whole reason why I'm talking about this to you today. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says that Peter stood up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and addressed them. And here's what Peter said. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And now he quotes Joel chapter two. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, remember, this is after Pentecost. Remember, the Holy Spirit comes into the upper room. People are baptized in his presence and they speak with other tongues and they spill out of that prayer room, go out in the streets and they're prophesying in tongues and they're proclaiming the marvelous works of God and they're declaring the glory of God. And people from all over the uh, the other uh, areas and they speak different languages are hearing these men and women and women prophesy, preach and speak in the name of the Lord, but they're hearing it in their own language. It's a supernatural event. The, the whole issue of tongues flowed from this moment. But here's the point that I'm making. Peter says that that is a fulfillment of a long-standing, centuries-old prophecy from the prophet Joel. And Joel is the one who said that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon men and women. And that part of that outpouring of the spirit would be that the women would prophesy. They would preach. They would declare the wonderful works of God. They would speak on behalf of God. And this is part of what I'm saying that the women of God ought to be saying today. My sisters in Christ, you daughters of God, there ought to be something in your heart today that gets before the Lord, that goes into the prayer chamber. And says, God, I recognize that I was born in a time and a season and a culture 
where many of your daughters have been muzzled. Many of your daughters have been forbidden to speak. Many of your daughters uh, are not allowed to prophesy. And that word in the Greek and in the Hebrew prophesy simply means to utter or declare truth on the behalf of God. It's the most basic word that means to speak for God. And I think some of the daughters of God, some Christian women, need to recognize that God is doing something in this season because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of the prophecy that Joel gave, that that began on the day of Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so the prophetic word that Joel gave that's in the Bible, Joel chapter 2, verses read verses 28 through 31, Joel 2, 28 through 31, this is what God said he was going to do in the last days. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to release an outpouring of my spirit. He's going to pour out the Holy Spirit. That's not just simply when we get saved and the moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. This is not simply um, having the Holy Spirit reside in you as a Christian. This is a continual outpouring that began on Pentecost 2,000 years ago that is to characterize all of the last days until Jesus comes again. And part of what the Bible says, the Bible says the outpouring will result in the women of God, Christian women, saved women, the daughters of God, the sisters in Christ. Part of the outpouring is that you're going to receive, some of you, an anointing of God to speak forth his glory and truth. Now, this presents, uh, presents a little bit of a predicament for a lot of men in the church because a lot of men in the church have misapplied some New Testament teaching and basically muzzled the daughters of God. Now, again, before you write me emails and before you start raising your hand in protest, I have already told you and I'll tell you again, I do believe in male headship, but I do not believe that male headship means that women can't lead, can't help can't use their gifts, can't prophesy, can't preach, can't teach, and can't speak. Whereas every local assembly needs to carefully go through the requirements of elders and leaders and find that place of symmetry with the scripture concerning the roles of women within the church, please don't make the mistake, please don't make the mistake of ever concluding that women cannot speak, preach, and teach the word of God. Because in order to say that, you have to take away what Joel 2 said, what Acts chapter 2 says. That in the last days, God will be releasing an outpouring of the Spirit, the result of which is, in part, women will preach and prophesy. So ladies, let me just ask you, what are you doing with that? What are you doing in a culture that doesn't make it easy on you? Just like the five daughters of Zelophehad, had. They didn't have it easy. It wasn't handed to them. They actually, in a certain sense, had to fight for it. Now, they did it in humility. They did it in integrity. They did it in honor of those that were over them, which happened to be all men. And so they didn't come in there all swaggery, trying to be macho and Goliath-like. And that's one of the biggest issues today that is also out of symmetry with the Word of God, is that today, in order for women to lead, they feel like they have to lead like men. They feel like they have to become masculine. They feel like they have to be like men. And the reason is, is they, they believe wrongly that in order for God to promote them, into their callings, they have to fight like men to get it. Nah, you don't have to do that. You just got to be a daughter of God who trusts and discerns. One of the things that the church is lacking in its leadership is the discernment, the level of special discernment that God often imparts to women at a level where he doesn't give it to men. Now, please understand me. We're all supposed to work together. I'm not downing men here at all. What I am doing is exposing that in the modern generation, really in the history of the church for the most part, after the original apostles died off, there's been a male control and oppression and suppression. Do I think that God will call more men to lead than women? I do believe that. But that's not to say that he doesn't call any women. Do I believe there will be more men preaching and teaching and leading and prophesying than women? I do believe that. But that is not to allow for the erroneous belief that no women can speak on behalf of God. 
You know, Paul would write to the church at Galatia in chapter number three, and he made a statement that has been wrongly used to remove gender lines. It's a a verse that a lot of liberals that want to support no gender and everybody can be a homosexual and everybody can be male if they want to be male and female if they want to be female. That's the wrong use. It's a demonic use of the verse I'm about to read you. But in Galatians 3 verse 28, it says, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. There's the word heir, inheritance. It's the same concept. That in, in Christ, there's no distinction between what a, whim, a woman, a daughter of God inherits from Christ and what a man of God inherits from Christ. So guys, this is where I'm saying right now, we've got to recognize God is wanting to do something that we have to respond to. We need to promote those that God has called from among our sisters and we need to endorse them. We need to help them. We also need to recognize, ladies, you don't have to be a man or masculine or, you know, aggressive. That's not the way God intends you to act in order to get what has been promised to you. All you've got to do is seek the Lord with a whole heart. Seek the Lord with a whole heart. He opens doors and he closes doors. And so if you and I can get to the place where we recognize that God is the one who's in control and when God has called you and we're petitioning the Lord to step into the fullness of your inheritance, nothing can stop you. Oh, you might have to fight a little bit for it because you're fighting against some systems that don't allow for you to easily step into it. But this is what I'm asking you, my sister in Christ, is it worth it? Is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and what you have in the inheritance in Jesus Christ, is it worth it for you to fight for? And you just got to learn how to fight in the spirit instead of fighting in the flesh. And you got to get free of bitterness and anger and hurt and wounds that came because men didn't listen. You got to go to the one man who always listens to you. And his name is Jesus Christ, the son of God, the Lord of glory, the king upon the throne who knows your name, knows why he brought you into a time such as this. And he knows what he has for you. So friends, These are where we need to just say, God, the time is now. This is the opportunity. And Lord, no matter what the system says, I'm going on what you say. Last verse and then I'm done. First Peter 3, 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they're heirs with you of the grace of life. Last thought, guys. If we don't honor women, we're disobeying the word of the Lord. And we got to recognize we are co-heirs in Jesus. Everything God has for us in Christ, he has for them in Christ. And now is the time for women to step up and men to say, yes, we want the voice of God's daughters um, influencing a generation for the glory of Jesus. Those are my thoughts today. We'll see you next time on Truth Shots.